Hello, hello. Today we'll be exploring the fascinating world of congenital abdominal wall defects. My name is Edward Shipper. I'm one of the surgical education fellows at the Goodman Surgical Education Center, and this video was prepared with the assistance of Dr. Matthias Bruzzoni, one of the staff pediatric surgeons at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. Let's review some goals and objectives. The goal of this video is to understand abdominal wall embryology, congenital abdominal wall defects, and the diagnosis and treatment of these defects. After viewing this video, the student will be able to name the anatomy of the embryo relevant to abdominal wall development, describe the essential components of embryologic development of the abdominal wall, name and describe the pathophysiology of common congenital abdominal wall defects, namely omphalocele and gastroschisis, distinguish between omphalocele and gastroschisis, describe how to diagnose omphalocele and gastroschisis, and describe how to manage omphalocele and gastroschisis. First, we'll explore the essential components of embryology that pertain to development of the abdominal wall. The embryo begins as a flat and disc-shaped structure without any body cavities early in development, with the umbilical stalk attached anteriorly. The embryo begins to take a three-dimensional form as the two lateral edges and the cephalic and caudal edges of the embryo migrate, or fold, anteriorly around week three and four. This folding occurs early in embryologic development as other organ systems are forming. The lateral folds will eventually become the abdominal wall and the normal development of the abdominal wall with the two rectus muscles aligned at the midline depends on these folds meeting together and fusing at the umbilicus. The folding of the lateral edges also creates two spaces bilaterally oriented in the cranial caudal axis known as the pleuroperitoneal canals, which are the precursors to the pleural cavity and the peritoneal cavity. The cephalic fold, which actually contains the developing heart, migrates anteriorly and caudally. In this fashion, the heart is delivered from the head region to the chest region. The cephalic fold also gives rise to the septum transversum, the precursor to the diaphragm, formally dividing the pleural cavities and the peritoneal cavity. The caudal fold, which contains the developing bladder, migrates anteriorly and cephalically to deliver the bladder to its normal position superior to the anus. During this time, the gastrointestinal tract has developed within the embryo as a single continuous tube structure. Later on in development, around week six, after organ systems have formed, the midgut elongates and leaves through the umbilicus to develop in a space within the umbilical stalk known as the umbilical coelom. After a few weeks of developing in the umbilical coelom, the midgut returns to the peritoneal cavity through the umbilicus around week 10 and undergoes rotation and fixation. Errors in normal embryologic development lead to congenital abdominal wall defects. This allows us to define umphalocele and gastroschisis. Umphalocele represents failure of the four abdominal wall folds to complete their migrations and fuse in the normal location. It is the second most common congenital abdominal wall defect. In gastroschisis, there is a failure of the umbilical coelom to develop, so the elongating intestine has no room to expand and bursts through the abdominal wall. Remember, as a result of these defects, the midgut never returned from the umbilical coelom into the peritoneal cavity to undergo normal rotation and fixation. So all children with these defects have non-rotation. This is different than malrotation. Unlike malrotation, this condition does not of itself predispose to small bowel obstruction. Congenital abdominal wall defects do not usually present as part of familial and genetic syndromes, although some genetic syndromes, especially Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, are associated with umphalocele. Let's take a look at each of these conditions in more detail. Here are some important categories that will help differentiate these entities. Site, where is the defect relative to the umbilicus? Sac, are the contents of the resultant defect covered by an amniotic membrane? Contents, which organs midgut and or viscera are in the defect, frequency, and associated anomalies.
Let's take a look at some of the characteristics of umphalocele in more detail. Umphalocele represents a failure of the lateral abdominal wall folds to meet in the midline, leading to a large, or greater than 4 centimeter, defect through the umbilicus. As a result, the defect is covered with an amniotic membrane. The rectus muscles are present, but often insert far apart on the costal margins. Because the defect is large, it contains midgut as well as other intra-abdominal viscera such as the liver or spleen. Because the liver is a relatively large viscous, umphalocele is the only congenital abdominal wall defect large enough where the liver may herniate through. Recall that the abdominal wall folding and fusion process occurs early, around weeks 3 and 4, during embryologic development. As a result, other organ systems tend to have associated abnormalities as well especially chromosomal and cardiac abnormalities. Lateral abdominal wall fold defects are relatively common, but rarely infants will present with defects in fusion of the cranial and cephalic folds. An abnormality in normal cranial folding can cause an isolated defect where the heart does not fold into its normal position inside the mediastinum, a condition known as ectopia cordis thoracus, or it can be part of a syndrome known as the pentalogy of Cantrell. The five components of this pentalogy are supraumbilical umphalocele, pericardial defect, meaning that the heart is in the umphalocele sac, intracardial defect, a defect in the central tendon of the diaphragm, and a sternal cleft. A defect in the caudal fold can cause an infraumbilical umphalocele with associated cloacal extrophy. Now let's take a look at some of the characteristics of gastroschisis. With gastroschisis, the abdominal wall folds fuse correctly with the rectus muscles in the normal position, but the umbilical coelom, remember, the space in the umbilical cord where the elongating midgut goes to develop, fails to form. And since there's not enough space in the peritoneal cavity, the midgut bursts through the abdominal wall. Therefore, the defect is small, less than 4 centimeters, and has no amniotic membrane covering it. Small viscera may protrude through the defect, but never the liver. The defect always occurs to the right of the umbilicus and is thought to be related to the normal resorption of the right umbilical vein during embryologic development that may cause a relative weakness on the right abdominal wall. Recall that the left umbilical vein persists in the body as the ligamentum teres hepatis in the falciform ligament. Remember that the development of the midgut and the umbilical coelom occurs later in embryologic development, around week 6, so other organ systems besides the gut are not usually affected. It may, however, present with intestinal atresia. Classically, gastroschisis is associated with premature birth and young maternal age. Here is a summary table comparing the characteristics of umphalocele versus gastroschisis. An easy way to remember things is that in umphalocele, you have a bad baby with good bowel, and in gastroschisis, you have a good baby with bad bowel. Diagnosis of congenital abdominal wall defects is usually made prenatally with ultrasound, although infants can also be diagnosed at birth on physical exam. Umphalocele can usually be distinguished from gastroschisis on ultrasound because umphalocele has an amniotic membrane, where gastroschisis does not, and the defect in umphalocele usually contains part of the liver, while gastroschisis does not. Diagnosis with amniotic fluid or serum testing is not reliable. The main clinical benefit of prenatal diagnosis of an abdominal wall defect is that it allows for prenatal counseling for the parents. Intervention is not typically pursued until birth. Now let's discuss how to manage congenital abdominal wall defects. First, some general considerations. The obstetric literature has not shown any clear difference in outcomes for infants with these conditions with cesarean section versus vaginal delivery. The mode of delivery should be decided primarily on the obstetric indications. The exposed intestines and viscera subject the infant to increased fluid and heat losses. Appropriate supportive measures, such as judicious resuscitation and warming maneuvers, should be taken. In the case of gastroschisis, where the intestines are completely exposed without an amniotic membrane, 
the infant may require placement of a plastic bowel bag known as a silo. The loss of normal abdominal wall function may also cause respiratory distress and endotracheal intubation may be required. Prophylactic antibiotics are used for gastroschisis because the intestines are exposed to the environment. They are not used for omphalocele where the intra-abdominal contents are protected by an amniotic membrane. With all of these defects, there may be some accompanying component of loss of abdominal domain, meaning that replacing the intestines and viscera in the peritoneal cavity may increase the intra-abdominal pressure to the point that local compressive effects will compromise the physiologic function of other organs. This is known as abdominal compartment syndrome. As such, the bowel should be decompressed quickly with placement of a nasogastric tube and rectal exam to help evacuate meconium. While the eviscerated intestines and viscera may appear normal immediately after delivery, they quickly become edematous. Early operation, less than one hour from delivery, may increase the chance of successful primary abdominal wall closure. Now let's discuss some specific considerations for the management of umphalocele. Remember, umphalocele is associated with other organ system abnormalities, especially chromosomal and cardiac defects, An echocardiogram and cardiology evaluation should be pursued promptly, although these should not delay operative intervention. The general management principle of umphalocele is protect the sac. The amniotic membrane or sac protects the intra-abdominal contents and allows them to develop properly. Disruption of the membrane is associated with a very poor prognosis. Typically, the sac is dressed with sylvidine cream to promote epithelialization. Note that this treatment does not directly address the abdominal wall defect. It is essentially a temporizing maneuver to allow the abdominal wall to grow and restore domain with reduction of intra-abdominal contents and repair of the abdominal wall defect planned for a later date, sometimes years later. Because the intestines are protected by the membrane with no intrinsic dysfunction, umphalocele babies can be fed early. Now we will discuss some specific considerations for the management of gastroschisis. Because the intestines are exposed to the environment with gastroschisis, it is imperative to provide immediate coverage. This can be done via two general approaches, primary reduction enclosure or placement of a silo with sequential tightening as part of a stage reduction enclosure. With primary reduction enclosure, the infant is taken directly to the operating room for repair of the abdominal wall defect. Because the infant may not have any significant intra-abdominal domain, primary closure is associated with an increased risk of abdominal compartment syndrome. If the surgeon does not believe that primary closure is possible, then she may pursue stage reduction while still immediately protecting the intestines by placing a plastic bag known as a silo over the exposed intestines. The silo can then be sequentially tightened from the top down to allow intra-abdominal domain to develop before pursuing definitive closure. Remember, with gastroschisis, the midgut did not undergo normal development in the umbilical coelom, so the intestines are intrinsically dysfunctional. Accordingly, these infants are placed on TPN and not fed until bowel function returns, usually in four to six weeks. Also, remember that gastroschisis can be associated with intestinal atresia. If the bowel function does not return in a reasonable time frame, then an upper GI series can be used to assess for intestinal atresia. And that concludes our riveting journey into the world of congenital abdominal wall defects. We hope you learned a lot.